Although this morning, I'm, I'm not actually going to read it from uh, uh, the Good News Bible, which I usually do, because then if you are using the Bible that's in the pews, you can follow along very easily. And if you want to do so, it's on page 198. There is a particular reason why I wish to read it from uh, the New International Version this morning. Romans chapter 10. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. For I can testify, I can testify about them that they are zealous for God. But their zeal is not based on knowledge. Since they did not know the righteousness of God, and they sought to establish their own, they did not submit to God's righteousness. But Christ is the culmination of the law, so that there may be righteousness for everyone who believes. Moses writes this about the righteousness that is given by the law. The person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that is by faith says, do not say in your hearts who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down. Or do not say who will descend into the deep, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. So what does it say? word is near you, it is in your mouth, and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. And that message is this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified. And it is with your mouth that you confess and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there's no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all, and blesses richly all who call on him. Because everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. The man never did any of the things that we would associate with greatness. So he never wrote a book. He never won the Champions League. He never became the new Prime Minister of his country. And yet, Jesus is Lord. For three years, he was an itinerant preacher. When popular opinion turned against him, one of his friends betrayed him, another denied him, and the others ran away. And yet, that man, Jesus, is Lord. Three days after his death, they find that the tomb is empty. He meets with his disciples. He meets with many others also. And they all know, this Jesus is Lord. Lord and Saviour. Now, many religions have their founders, their leaders. And while we respect others and we respect what they believe, there is none that compares with Jesus. And he is the very heart and centre of our Christian faith. Now, that may sound obvious, but we need to say it. 
Because Christian faith is not primarily about a higher moral standard. It's not simply about better social conditions or a greener planet or a nice feeling inside. The focus, the centre, the very heart of Christian faith is this man, the Lord, the one we call Jesus. You see, Islam calls men and women to fear God, to keep his commands, and to do good works and hope that at the end of the day the good deeds will outweigh our failings. Sikhism looks for salvation based on the things that we can do. And many aspects of Hinduism rests on karma, which is a, a selfless action done for the good of others. But it's the gospel of Jesus Christ that is based not in any tiny form on what I do, but on what he has already done. And these verses in Romans 10 bring us clearly to the heart of the gospel. Identifies for us those crucial things that we need to believe. See, if someone says to you, what do I need to believe to be a Christian? What are you going to say? Probably our minds will start racing. Where am I going to start? Where am I going to finish? What am I going to put in between? And how am I going to get from one place to the other? Now, if we sang words like the creed more often, we would have a very simple statement of our faith. It begins with God, the Father Almighty. The coming of his son in the end of the day to judge the world and to establish his eternal kingdom. But Romans 12 points us to those things that are most crucial for us. First of all, that Jesus is Lord. And the Greek word there is kurios. And when people came to translate the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, kurios was the word that they used for Lord. Kurios was the word that they used for that very special name of God that we often speak of as Yahweh. And so what is being said here in these verses is that those who confess that Jesus is Lord in the absolute sense, that he is God, that he is the Almighty, it's those men and women who will be saved. Apostle John writes something very similar towards the end of his gospel. He says, I've written all of these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Others may say good things about Jesus. They may say that he was a great prophet. may even call him an apostle. Accept that he was the son of Mary. Even call him the word of God. That's not enough. See, in fact, Islam deliberately denies that he is son of God. Scriptures say that the first content of saving faith is that Jesus is Lord. The letter to the Hebrews was written to some Christians whose faith was uh, becoming a little jelly-like. It was wobbling. They were being persecuted, yes. But they were wondering whether it was all worthwhile. Whether the things that they had believed and accepted about Jesus, that he was indeed the Christ whom God had promised, was it actually really true? And the reason for the wobbly is because they were not absolutely clear on who he is. And so those opening verses, the Hebrews set out to put that right. They say that he is the very brightness of the glory of God. That's not saying that like Moses, who when he was in the presence of God came out and his face was shining a little bit and it faded. No, this is to say that he fully has the glory of God and reveals it to us. 
He then says that he is the exact likeness of the invisible God. We can't physically see God. But actually we do in Jesus Christ. And then it says that this Jesus is the one who, by the word of his power, upholds all things. That is, holds them together. Or in the words of the song, he's got the whole world in his hands. Our confession of faith is that Jesus is Lord. And that's not only a confession of his eternal deity and his sovereignty over all things, it actually also points to his incarnation. Because we're saying that it is Jesus of Nazareth who is Lord of all. It's the man, Jesus, who is Lord. And raises the question, well, how on earth is that possible? How could that be? Is it not blasphemy to speak of him in that kind of way? The answer is no, it's not. Because to say that Jesus is Lord is to say that in his incredible mercy and grace, the eternal Son of God left the glory of heaven and became incarnate. That is, took human flesh and as a human man lived among us. But can we be sure that this is what Paul means here in these verses? Or might he be mistaken? Because the word kurios can be translated and used in a number of different ways. It can sometimes simply be a polite form of address in which we may say to someone, sir or madam. And in John chapter 12, there is a moment when some people come and they they find one of the disciples called Philip and they come to Philip and they say to him, "Uh, Lord, we want to see Jesus. Kurios is the word that they use. Quite simply, they are simply addressing him politely, sir. If we could see Jesus, we would really appreciate that. The word kurios can also mean something a little more. It can mean someone who is owner or master. And when Jesus is talking in in Matthew chapter 6, he's saying to us, you can't serve two masters. You can't serve both God and money. Because you cannot give your devotion equally to both. There will be moments when one will take priority over the other. And there the word having two laws means having two masters, two owners. But clearly the word kurios is used to speak of deity in the fullest possible sense. Mark does this in the beginning of his gospel. He has John the Baptist appearing on the scene and John the Baptist saying, prepare the way of the Lord. And everybody is agreeing that John the Baptist is quoting from the prophet Isaiah. And if we go back 800 years to the prophet Isaiah and read in chapter 40, we'll find him calling on the people to prepare the way of the Lord. And quite clearly in Isaiah, Lord means Yahweh, God. The God of Israel, the God of the world. And yet, when John the Baptist is quoting those very words, deliberately, he is telling the people to prepare for the coming of Jesus. For Jesus is, in that fullest sense, the Lord. But did the people in Jesus' day intend that when they spoke to him? Think of the woman whose child was very poorly and comes and and addresses him as kurios. It may actually simply be that she is being polite to him. After all, she wants a special favour from him. 
And it is not a problem for us to accept that the understanding of who Jesus is developed as we go through the Gospels. We don't have to insist that from the very beginning, that everybody knew that he is Lord in the full sense. But there are clearly moments, clearly moments. For example, in John chapter 11, we read of the time when uh, one of Jesus' closest friends, Lazarus, had died. And Jesus goes and he, one by one, speaks with the two sisters, Martha and Mary. And as he speaks to Martha, he says to her, I'm the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives believing in me will never die. Do you believe this, Martha? And she says, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. Don't think it's stretching it at all to understand that when she addresses him here as Lord, that in the light of what she's going to say, she is confessing him as Lord in the full sense. And so the first content of faith is for us to believe that Jesus is Lord. The second, as we find it here in Romans chapter 10, is that God has raised him from the dead. And here we need to consider both the fact of that resurrection and then also the significance of it. The fact we considered a few weeks ago on Easter Sunday. And as we read through the book of Acts and listen to the apostles as they preach and as they tell others about Jesus Christ and his resurrection, they say, listen, we are witnesses of this. We were there. We saw the empty tomb and we met the risen Lord. We are witnesses of his resurrection. The women were witnesses of his resurrection. They followed after his body was taken from the cross and they noted carefully where he was placed. There was no mistake about the tomb that they went back to on that resurrection morning. The angels were witnesses. They said, he's not here because he is risen. And then one by one, two by two, and suddenly by groups, they begin to meet him. The women on their way to tell the disciples, Mary, who stayed behind in the garden, the ten who were in the upper room. There was simply no doubt about it. The Jesus who was crucified is the Jesus who was raised to life again. But the fact on its own doesn't make any difference. It's the significance of his resurrection that is so important to us. It's significant, first of all, because it proves who he is. Paul actually opens this letter to the Romans by saying that Jesus was shown with power to be the Son of God. By his resurrection. The resurrection demonstrates to us that he is Lord. The resurrection also helps to explain why he died. Because is there not a question here? If he is Lord of all, then what on earth is he doing hanging on a cross and dying? It doesn't make any sense. But let Jesus himself explain in his own words. I have come not to be served, but to serve. And to give my life as a ransom for many. And so the statement of his resurrection explains why he died and affirms also that that sacrifice has been accepted. Jesus on the cross utters those words, it's finished, I've done it, that's it now, completed. 
But if he's buried and shut away in a tomb, how do we know? The resurrection is God's public announcement that he is satisfied with and accepts the work of his son upon a cross. Further, the resurrection is significant because it tells us that all of our enemies have been defeated. Every accusation of the Lord against us, he's dealt with that. Every word, thought, desire, action that has fallen short of the glory and the holiness of God, that's been removed too because he's paid the price for that. Upon the cross and in his resurrection, he conquered every power of Satan and darkness. And clearly, of course, he conquers the grave itself. Thy be the glory. Risen, conquering son we sing. And so we should. And not just on Easter Sunday. But as we said on Thursday... His resurrection also points us to his ascension. Because if he was raised to life again, never more to die, well, don't we need to know where is he then? Because he never comes up on the news walking around Israel anymore. And so his resurrection points us to his ascension. So the book of Hebrews says, He is our great high priest, and he has gone through the heavens where now he is seated for us. Just as the high priest on the the Day of Atonement would take blood and go through the curtain into the most holy place of the tabernacle and there offer blood for the people, our great high priest has ascended through the clouds, through the heavens, into the very throne room of God, where he has taken his seat and pleads for us the value of his precious blood. But if his resurrection points to his ascension, does it not also point to his coming again? Again, we read it on Thursday evening. This same Jesus, who you have seen gone into heaven, will come again in the same way that you have seen him go. He will come as king. He will come and establish his eternal kingdom. He would also come and judge the world. And so when the scriptures speak of his resurrection, his ascension and his coming, there is always a call to trust him and to repent. Because if he is coming again, the question is, are we ready? If he's coming as king, are we ready to welcome him in his glory and to honour him? If he's coming as judge of all the world, and he is, then how will things go for us when we, when I, stand before him? Because I know and I believe in your hearts, you know, that somewhere along the line, we've not met the standard that God desires. The only way for us to be ready is the way that is presented in these verses for us here. To believe with the whole of our heart and to confess with our mouths. We will not be ready if we rely on our good works and hope that they outbalance the bad ones. We will not be ready, even if there is some form of devotion expressed, whether it be in song or in prayer or in meditation or in fasting. Those are good things. The only way that we will be ready is if we rely not upon ourselves in the slightest, but wholly on what he has done for us. And so we're called to believe. And the first aspect of belief is that we accept certain truths about the Lord Jesus. In other words, faith is something objective. As we were singing, as we were taking up the offering, I believe. I believe. I believe in these things. 
And it's really important that faith has content. And it's important for two reasons. First of all, we live in days which are so totally subjective. Almost everything begins with me and then, whoa, surprisingly ends with me too. It's what I like. It's what I feel. It's what I desire. It's that happiness or peace of mind that I'm longing for. Peace of mind is only going to come through the, God's, through the forgiveness of God, as we believe in his Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. But having faith that is objective is essential also, because it's the only way that we can measure religious experience. You know, it's quite possible to come into church and have an experience of some kind. Might be that if we sat down for too long, our behind becomes a little numb. It might be that the music is great and we feel a, a sense of euphoria or something. But how do we measure it? See, we can measure height with a ruler. As summer begins to come, we can measure the rising temperatures with a thermometer. And we can check the genuineness and identity of our passport through a whole range of security features. But how do we measure? How do we know the genuineness of some religious experience? The answer is by the words of the Scriptures, by the faith that we are called to believe. And yet, that on its own is not enough. Remember the words of James? You believe in God? You believe that there is a God? Well, that's great. That's good. Yeah, the devil does too and is uh, scared stiff. That's why the scriptures here call us to believe in our hearts. And that's why I read from the New International Version because unfortunately the Good News Bible misses that bit. That's the word that is there in the Greek text. If you believe in your heart. For it is in the heart that we believe. And that's really important. Because in Scripture, the heart isn't just our feelings. You know, when uh, February comes, all the shops are filled with cards, with pictures of hearts, and it's all about love and a nice feeling towards somebody who's near to you. Well, that's okay, that's good. But that's not what the Bible means by our heart. It may include our feelings, but the heart is the very center, the very core of our being. And so to believe in our heart means to believe with all that we are. In essence, it's to stake everything that we are now and everything that we hope for in the future upon who Jesus is and what he's done for us which is, I hope you can see far more than just, oh yeah, I, I accept that he lived on earth. Yeah, okay, I accept he died and rose again. Yeah, okay, I believe that he's, he's Lord, if that's what it means. To believe in the heart is much more than that. Clearly, it includes our thoughts, but more importantly, involves the whole of our being. And that's important because while there are truths to believe in, the very heart of faith is the person in whom we put that trust. That he is the Lord. That he is the Savior. That he is the one who died for us. That he is the one who rose again. That he is the one ascended and seated in heaven. That he is the one coming again. That he is the one in whose name there is forgiveness. And so we're called to believe in him. Not just certain truths about him, though that is essential but with the heart to believe and to commit our whole selves to him. But then says Paul, and confess with our mouth. And there are two things that I want to touch very briefly here because 
Those are words that could just cause perhaps some concern for us. The first is that this confession is not some action or work that saves us. Because if it is, then we are being saved by works. And the whole point of Romans 10 is the contrast that by our actions and our works, it is impossible. It's only through faith. But the second issue is that as we begin to think about confessing with the mouth, maybe where some of us begin to feel perhaps a little anxious or troubled maybe guilty. Because when we were talking with our neighbour over the fence on Wednesday evening, we didn't somehow bring Jesus into the conversation. Or we didn't take the bag full of tracks into work every day with us, or to the school gate this week. But I don't think that's what Paul is talking about. He's not saying go and bash people over the head every moment you can with your faith. He's not saying that. The confession of the mouth is to express what is within the heart. Isn't that what Jesus said? Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And I think actually, as I I read the New Testament, the thing to confess with the mouth, I'm sure that's really linked with the baptism. That was the moment when people would stand up and confess, he is Lord and I'm going to be baptized in submission to his lordship. Isn't that what Peter was saying on the day of Pentecost at the end of his message? Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Not because baptism itself will save you, but because that will express and show what's taken place inside here. So I ask the question this morning, if you believe in your heart, What stops you confessing him in baptism if you haven't been baptized yet? And while Paul definitely says confessing with the mouth, that actually is only a part of it. Don't we confess Christ every day of the week in all of our actions, in the way we speak to people, the way we relate to others, the way we drive our cars, When it comes to confidence in using our mouth, I think rather than focus on what we find difficult sometimes, the hesitancy we feel or the guilt we feel we're not doing it enough, let's focus first, again and again, on the splendor of who Jesus is. The wonder of what he has done for us. Let us allow that to thrill our heart rather than worry about, oh, I'm not saying enough to somebody today. Let our vision of who Jesus is, our joy in what he has done for us, take center stage. And with the help of the gift of the Spirit, I'm sure he will enable us to speak when the moment is there. I hope the last few weeks, as we have thought about understanding something of what others believe, has been helpful. More importantly, I hope that we have been reminded of those things that are most precious to us. The faith that we hold. That Jesus Christ is Lord. That Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead. And to him belongs glory, honour, and praise, all of it.